Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. When we last met, we started talking about interactions between light and matter, and we saw that when a molecule absorbs a photon, the result can be an increase in the kinetic energy of the molecule, the potential energy, or a combination of both. Today, we'll start talking about one of the forms this energy can take, rotational energy. As we'll see, this is a kind of kinetic energy that a molecule can have. But first, I want to take a minute to review some more units that are helpful to know about when you're studying spectroscopy. Over the years, you've probably done several experiments where you either talked about the absorbance of a molecule or its percent transmittance, and you've also probably used the Beer-Lambert law, sometimes just called Beer's law. That's the equation that describes the connection between the absorbance of a solution and its concentration, and it looks like this. In this equation, Capital A is the absorbance, which describes how much light of a particular wavelength is absorbed. The small a is called the molar absorptivity, which is a constant that's different depending on the substance doing the absorbing and the wavelength of the light. The letter b is called the path length, which is the distance the light has traveled through the solution. And c is the concentration in molarity. Notice the units in the items of this equation. The absorbance is a unitless number, so all the units on the right side of the equation must cancel out. We usually measure the concentration in molarity, and the path length is in centimeters, so the units of the molar absorptivity are in reciprocal molarity times reciprocal centimeters. Beer's law was named for the German physicist August Beer, who wrote the equation as we now know it in 1852 but he actually wasn't the discoverer of the relationship between concentration and absorbance. It was originally discovered by the French physicist Pierre Bouget in 1729, who realized how the path length and the absorbance were connected when he was contemplating the color of light that passed through a glass of red wine. Later, in 1760, the German physicist Johann Lambert realized that concentration and absorbance were also related, almost a hundred years before August Beer formulated his famous equation. But what exactly is absorbance anyway? Absorbance is a way of comparing the intensity of the light that goes into a sample versus the amount that comes out. Here's an equation that defines absorbance. In this equation, I0 is the intensity of the light that goes in, and I is the intensity that comes out. As you can see, there's a logarithm in that equation. In contrast, the percent transmittance is not a logarithm. Instead, the percent transmittance is defined by this equation. Notice that this time, I is in the numerator, not the denominator. For that reason, the transmittance is higher the more light comes out of the sample, unlike the absorbance, which is higher the lower I is. Notice what happens if we take the logarithm of both sides of the transmittance equation. If you remember the way logarithms work, you might recall that the logarithm of two things that are multiplied together is the same as the logarithm of each one added together. Now on the right side, we have the logarithm of 100, which is equal to 2. And if you compare the other term to the definition of absorbance we saw earlier, you'll see that this term is the same as negative a. So the logarithm of the percent transmittance is just equal to 2 minus a. That allows us to convert easily between absorbance and transmittance. Now that we've reviewed those units, let's think about what kinds of things can happen when a molecule absorbs light. To start, let's quickly sum up some of the concepts we've learned so far that'll play a part in our understanding of spectroscopy. First, all physical systems, from simple ones like electrons to complex ones like molecules or groups of molecules, have properties like those of a wave, and this is especially noticeable for systems with a very low mass, like single electrons or atoms. We also saw that the total energy of a system is given by the Schrodinger equation, which is this for a one-dimensional system, and this for a three-dimensional one. So, how can we apply this to the interaction between a photon and a molecule? 
Well, we mentioned that molecules can increase their rotational or vibrational energy when they absorb a photon. Today, let's just consider the change in rotational energy. We'll think about vibrational energy in some future videos. To think about rotational energy, let's use the simplest model possible, a diatomic molecule. We'll imagine that the molecule spins around an axis. Also, we'll imagine that the bond between the atoms doesn't vibrate. In reality, it would vibrate, but simplifying it this way makes the mathematics much simpler and doesn't significantly change the results we'll get today. Since the molecule doesn't vibrate, this model is called a rigid rotor molecule. And it's one of the five different simple models we often use to understand quantum mechanics. You've actually already seen two of the other models, the particle in a box and the particle in a well. Anyway, rotational energy, like what we see in the rigid rotor, is entirely kinetic energy, not potential energy. You might recall that, for an object moving in a straight line, the equation for kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. It's a little different for a rigid rotor. Instead, we have this equation. In this expression, the lowercase omega is related to the frequency with which the molecule spins. Omega is equal to 2 pi times the rotational frequency, so we can write the equation this way. Meanwhile, I is the moment of inertia, which is a measure of how difficult it is to cause an object to rotate. It's equal to mu times r squared. The r here is equal to the distance between the two atoms, and mu is called the reduced mass, which is given by this expression. In this equation, m1 and m2 are the masses of the two atoms. You might be wondering why we're using the reduced mass and not just the ordinary mass. That's because the two atoms may have two very different masses. For example, suppose we're looking at hydrogen iodide. The iodine atom is much heavier than the hydrogen, and that has a profound impact on the way the molecule rotates. If you've ever seen a juggler tossing clubs through the air, you know that the club doesn't rotate around a point halfway between the top and the bottom. Instead, the bottom is heavier, and the center of mass of the club is therefore closer to the bottom, and the axis of rotation of an object always passes through the center of mass. That means the club rotates around a point in the lower part of the club. In the same way, the hydrogen iodide molecule rotates around a point much closer to the iodine, because that's where the center of mass is. And that's why we use the reduced mass instead of the plane mass of the molecule. The reduced mass takes into account the fact that the axis of rotation may not be in the middle of the bond. So, for example, consider our hydrogen iodide molecule. What will be its reduced mass? To find out, we need to be a little careful. Both hydrogen and iodine have more than one possible isotope, and their masses will depend on which isotope we've got. Usually in chemistry courses, we just assume that the mass is whatever it says on the periodic table, which is a weighted average of the masses of all the stable isotopes of that element. However, as we'll see in the next several videos, the isotope we have can have a significant impact on the rotational and vibrational spectra of a molecule, so we need to be specific about which isotopes we're using. In this case, let's imagine we have hydrogen-1 and iodine-127, which are the most common isotopes for both of those elements. In that case, we can use 1 AMU for mass 1 and 127 AMU for mass 2. That gives us a reduced mass of 0 0.99219 AMUs. When we use the reduced mass in a calculation, we'll usually want to have it in SI units, which for a mass means kilograms. As you might remember from your general chemistry days, the conversion factor between AMUs and grams is Avogadro's number. So, our reduced mass is 1.6476 times 10 to the minus 24 grams, which is 
1.6476 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. But there's a slight problem with the equation that we saw for the energy of a rigid rotor. This equation comes from classical physics, which assumes that a system can have any value for its energy. But we know from our discussions in the first video of this course that the energy of a system is quantized. In order to get a more realistic picture of the energy of a rigid rotor, we therefore need to use the equations of quantum mechanics. As we mentioned earlier, that means we need to use the Schrodinger equation. We can simplify the Schrodinger equation a bit because we know that rotational energy is a form of kinetic energy, so the potential energy term drops out, and we're left with this. However, right now this equation would actually be mathematically very difficult to use. As you know, a rotating molecule tumbles end over end, so it traces out a curved path as it moves, not a straight line. But circles and curves are described by rather awkward equations when we use Cartesian coordinates. The mathematics we're about to do will be much simpler if we use spherical coordinates instead. For example, Consider the equation for the surface of a sphere with radius 3, and with its center at the origin. In Cartesian coordinates, the equation for the sphere is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 3. In contrast, the equation in spherical coordinates is simply r equals 3. Clearly, the equation in spherical coordinates is much simpler, and that'll be the case for most equations involving curved shapes. That includes the shapes of orbitals, which we'll cover later in the course, so we should start to get used to working in spherical coordinates from now on. So, let's spend the rest of this video reviewing spherical coordinates and how they're related to the more familiar Cartesian coordinates we've been using up to now. Instead of x, y, and z, the coordinates we use in the spherical system are r, theta, and phi. r is just the distance from the origin, so it can have any value between 0 and infinity. Theta is the angle between the point we're interested in and the z-axis, which is the vertical axis. If the point we want is actually on the positive z-axis, then theta would be equal to 0. The angle increases as we go further away from the positive z-axis. We measure the angle in radians, so it increases to pi over 2 if the point we want is on the xy plane, and continues to increase to positive pi if the point is on the negative z-axis. So the value of theta is always between 0 and pi. The third coordinate is phi which is the angle in the xy plane we need to reach in order to be directly above or below the point we're interested in. As you're probably familiar with if you've taken a trigonometry class, we measure the angle by moving counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. So the value of phi is always between 0 and 2 pi. Of course, Cartesian coordinates are much more familiar to most people, so let's see how to convert from one coordinate system to another. Here's how to calculate r from the Cartesian coordinates. As you can see, this is just a version of the Pythagorean theorem extended to three dimensions. Meanwhile, trigonometry tells us that the cosine of theta is equal to z divided by r. So, to find theta, we take the arc cosine of this quantity. And finally, the tangent of phi is just y over x. We can also go in the reverse direction. If we want to convert from spherical coordinates to Cartesian ones, we can use these equations. Let's try an example. Suppose we're interested in a point located at coordinates negative 2, 3, and 1 in Cartesian coordinates. What would be the position in spherical coordinates? We'll use these equations. For r, we have the square root of negative 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 1 squared, which gives us about 
If we plug the coordinates into our equation for theta, we find that the cosine of theta is equal to 0.2673. That makes theta equal to 1.300. Finally, when we use the equation for phi, we find out that the tangent of phi is negative 1.5. That gives us phi is equal to negative 0.9828. But wait, remember, we said we need phi to have a value between 0 and 2 pi. In this case, we got a negative number. And that means that our calculator calculated the value of phi we'd get if we had gone clockwise from the positive x-axis instead of counterclockwise. The value of the tangent repeats every pi radians. So to correct our negative number, we just need to add pi to our value, which gives us 2.159. This is important to remember. If you ever end up with a negative value for phi, just add pi to it in order to convert it to a value in the range between 0 and 2 pi. Let's try one more calculation with spherical coordinates. Suppose we had a sphere with a radius of 1. What would be the volume of the sphere? There are a few different ways we could calculate this. In fact, you may have learned a formula for the volume of a sphere back when you took geometry in high school. But today, I want to solve this problem using calculus so that we can see how to use spherical coordinates in an integral. You might recall from your calculus course that taking the integral of a curve that just has x and y as its variables gives us the area under the curve. In the same way, taking an integral when we have three coordinates gives us the volume instead of the area. So to find the volume of our sphere, we just need to take the integral of it. But there's a complication. In Cartesian coordinates, an integral in three dimensions would look like this. We integrate over the x, y, and z coordinates separately, and we can have limits that go from negative to positive infinity in each of those dimensions. But in spherical coordinates, the integral looks much different. First of all, notice that the limits can range from 0 to infinity for r, 0 to pi for theta, and 0 to 2 pi for phi. Also, notice that the integrals are ordered so that the innermost integral goes with the innermost differential, and so on as we move outward. So, since dr is the innermost differential, the innermost integral is for r, followed by theta, and then phi. But the biggest difference is here. In Cartesian coordinates, dx, dy, and dz describe what's called the volume element. In the case of Cartesian coordinates, this is an infinitesimally small cube because the x, y, and z axes are all perpendicular to each other. But in spherical coordinates, r, theta, and phi are not perpendicular, so the volume element isn't a tiny cube. Instead, you can get a sense of its shape from this picture. As you can see, the volume element is curved and is also slightly smaller on the end that's closer to the origin. For that reason, we can't just use dr, d theta, d phi for our volume element because that would give us a cube shape, which would be incorrect. Instead, the shape of the volume element is given by this, r squared times sine theta times dr, d theta, d phi. The important thing to remember is that this entire expression is the volume element. Every three-dimensional integral you write in spherical coordinates should end with r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi, just as you would write every integral in Cartesian coordinates with dx dy dz. The r squared sine theta part is a necessary part of every three-dimensional integral in spherical coordinates and should be there in addition to whatever else you're taking the integral of. Anyway, now that we know that, let's find the volume of our sphere. 
Since our sphere has a radius of 1, that'll be the upper limit of our integral in the r dimension. The limits in the other two dimensions don't change because every value of theta and phi is possible in a sphere. So now we'll solve these integrals. We usually begin with the innermost integral and work our way outward. The innermost integral is for the variable r. Since theta and phi are constants with respect to this integral, we can factor terms containing those out of the integral. So now our inner integral is just r squared dr with limits from 0 to 1. Solving that integral gives us r cubed over 3, and applying the limits gives us 1 third. Since 1 third is a constant, we'll factor that out of the integrals. And now we're ready to solve the second integral. This integral is taken with respect to theta, so once again, we'll factor d phi out of this integral. That means our second integral is now just sine theta d theta. The solution to that is negative cosine theta, with limits from 0 to pi. If we apply those limits, we find that this integral is equal to negative negative 1 minus negative 1. It's important to be careful with all those negative signs, but when we solve it, we get positive 2. Once again, we can factor that out of the integral. And that leaves us with our third and final integral, which is simply the integral of d phi from 0 to 2 pi. The solution to that integral is just phi, with limits of 0 and 2 times pi. That gives us 2 pi for the answer to our last integral, and gives us a final answer of 4 thirds times pi. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll use what we learned today to determine the energy of a rigid rotor, and we'll be able to apply that to understand what a rotational spectrum is telling us about the structure of a molecule. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.